Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The passage we'll talk about this morning is the Gospel for today from Mark 1, also with reference to other passages that relate to today's Gospel. Dear friends in Christ, I'm going to start out this morning by asking a question. Just by chance, have you noticed at all that we are in a presidential election year. You'd have to be under a rock a thousand feet below the earth to not know that we're in the beginning of 2012, yet another year when we're voting for president. And while the election and the whole process can seem to be interesting at times, it also can be very frustrating too. This year, I've noticed, maybe I'm wrong, but it seems like this year, we are being absolutely bombarded with more debates than ever between the candidates. Seems like not a day goes by that there isn't another debate being held somewhere in the country. And of course, between the debates on the Republican side and then the uh, president's speech that he just gave the State of the Union a few days ago, we are not only hearing the candidates beat each other up and attack each other, but we certainly know that we are at the beginning again of another season of campaign promises. Promises being made from A to Z about everything. And while we care about the promises that are being made at election time, and we think it's very important that those promises be kept. But God only knows which of those promises actually will be kept and which of them are going to be ignored, which will be forgotten altogether, and which will simply be absolutely impossible to keep even right from the moment that they're spoken. And of course, if those promises are kept, we better hang on to our wallets and watch out for the tax bills that we'll be paying in the years to come. Now, many of us have probably given up putting much stock in campaign promises long ago because sad but true to say, a lot of times candidates will say almost anything just to get elected. And then also, sometimes the circumstances of life or what's happening in the world make promises that were made at one point in time almost irrelevant later on. Then even with our favorite candidates, the ones we vote for, the ones we trust, we want to believe that they're going to be able to do what they say and carry out their promises. But because they are human beings, and they simply do not have control over everything that's happening in the world, we know and we even understand when every promise they make just cannot be kept. At the very least, we want our political leaders to be honest when they speak to us, and we want them to lead and to act with personal integrity. Now, obviously, that's not just the case for political leaders, but it is especially true of spiritual leaders. And I say especially true for spiritual leaders for a couple reasons. First of all, the promises and the pronouncements of political leaders only have an impact on our lives in the here and now or at best for as long as we live. But the words and the deeds of spiritual leaders have an impact on us, not just while we're alive in this world, but they have an impact on us really for all eternity because spiritual leaders represent the Lord himself and they're the ones who speak God's word to us. So it cannot be more important for those spiritual leaders to be trustworthy in what they say and in what they do. That point is made clear in the Old Testament lesson. 
We didn't read this for today, but the Old Testament lesson that's normally assigned for the fourth Sunday after Epiphany is found in Deuteronomy chapter 18. And that passage talks about prophets, specifically those prophets that God wants us to listen to. In that passage in, Mo, in uh, Deuteronomy 18, Moses records for us God's own words, where God says, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And if you say in your heart, how may we know the word that the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. Now, of course, the prophets whose writings are found in the Bible were and are trustworthy prophets whose words we can certainly take to heart and whose messages, and above all, whose promises come from God himself. Because no word that a prophet speaks comes from the prophet's own brain, but God gives them the word and the message and the promises to tell. And many of the prophecies, many of the promises of God spoken by the prophets had to do with the coming of the Savior. They had to do with what that promised Savior was going to say and what he would do. One of the key Old Testament passages that foretold the ministry of the Savior is found in Isaiah chapter 61, where it is written, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, and to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Of course, all of those promises of God spoken by the ancient prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and all the others, these promises either were already fulfilled or are yet to be fulfilled in the first coming of Christ and in his second coming at the end of time. They were fulfilled through the life and the ministry of God's greatest prophet, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. During this season in the church year of Epiphany, the gospel readings are coming to us every week from the first couple chapters of Mark. And they showed the people of Galilee and Judea 2,000 years ago. And of course, they continue to show to us who Jesus was, is, and always will be. That he is namely the Son of God by what he said and also by what he did. We've already seen that a few weeks ago in Jesus' baptism by John at the Jordan River. We saw that in his calling of the apostles in last week's gospel where the passage started out with Mark writing about Jesus preaching the divine message. Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Then again, in today's gospel, we see Jesus speaking in a way that people recognized as being a direct reflection of the power of God himself. Let's read these words together. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching 
because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. And of course, that authority was the authority of God himself. When Jesus spoke, this was God speaking. It wasn't just a priest or an expert on the Bible giving opinions about what God was saying at all. Then, also in today's Gospel, when Jesus cast the evil spirit out of the demon-possessed man, Jesus again showed that he was keeping the promises of God in an unmistakable way that everybody who saw this could see. And Mark tells us about this. He said, again, the people were so amazed that they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching and with authority, the authority of God himself. He even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. The rest of the first chapter of Mark, going into Mark chapter 2, it's a rapid fire, bang, bang, bang description of how Jesus again and again and again kept God's promises that first came through the words of the prophets. He kept God's promises to bring freedom and release from physical and spiritual sickness. When he healed Peter's mother-in-law, uh, she was sick, she had a fever, everyone was afraid for her, Jesus came to her, healed her immediately. When that happened, people went out of Peter's house and they told everybody else at Capernaum, bring all the sick, bring everyone who's got a disease, bring them to Jesus because he can heal them, and of course, he did. Then after that, he went off and healed a man who was plagued by leprosy. Then after that, he forgave the sins, which only God can do. He forgave the sins and completely healed a man who was plagued by paralysis. And when you read through Mark and all the Gospels, you see that over and over and over again, Jesus kept God's promises by bringing healing of body, mind, and soul. And what's interesting about these healings that Jesus did is that he didn't just zap away a person's illness or disease, but when you read in the prophet Isaiah 53, Jesus actually took sickness and disease as well as our sin. He took it into his own body and literally carried it away from us. So we see that in those words from Isaiah 53, and let's read them together. Surely he bore our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. When you read the words of the Bible, it is clear that God is a promise maker. And when you read the words of the Gospels, it is also crystal clear that Jesus is the ultimate promise keeper for you and me and everyone in the world. So that lets us know that all of God's word is absolutely trustworthy. We can rely on him. We can rely on the Lord's help when we are in physical need. We can pray to him at any time for healing. A great reminder of that is found in a passage in James chapter 5, where it's written, Is anyone among you in trouble? Is anyone among you sick? Let them call on the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they've sinned, they'll be forgiven. The power of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Isn't it great to know that we can trust God? We can trust in the Lord to keep his promises to help us no matter what our need is. And each of us knows in our heart of hearts exactly what it is that we need right at this moment of time. Be it peace of mind as we're facing a major decision in our life, or having a sense of security about our jobs, or having a sense that we have enough money to fix the car, repair the house, pay our bills, or the wisdom that we need to know what to say 
to someone who's causing a problem in our life, or healing in a relationship with husband, wife, children, some extended member of the family, or a good friend. Every one of us has serious needs in our life at one point or another, whether it be today or at any other time. And we are reminded that we can always trust Jesus to keep his promises to be with us. And we know that he keeps his promise to us per personally because he fulfills that need that you and I and everyone in the world has. He fulfills that need that we all have for spiritual healing. And he does that by coming to us individually to apply to us the forgiveness of sins that he already earned for us through his suffering and death on the cross. Of course, we know very well that this weekend is baptismal weekend here at St. Peter's. And this morning we've had the privilege of seeing three little ones, Nicholas and Jennifer and Anna, brought into God's kingdom through the water of their baptism. Their sins have been washed away once for all time. And as each of us see that, of course, we're reminded that we all have been baptized. Our sins have been washed away by Jesus himself. And then again, any time and every time we come to the Lord's table, we are once again receiving the forgiveness of our sins in the most intensely personal way as we take the body and blood of Christ that he offered as sacrifice for us and we receive that directly from him. So as we move on in this presidential election year, being bombarded by all kinds of political promises, we know that because the candidates are human beings, even when they have the best of intentions, we just can't trust that they're always going to be able to keep their promises. But here in God's house, we always know that the promises made by our almighty God in his word are always kept. And we can entrust ourselves fully to his care, no matter what the circumstances of our lives happen to be. Thanks be to God for that, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.